Assalamu alaikum brothers. So Jazakallah khair for inviting me. Um, today, with Ramadan approaching tonight, inshallah, going to be a short lecture on the medical side of fasting. Now, I'm a doctor by training. I, I'm not an alim, so I will try to stray away from some of the Akida issues and Fiqh issues. And uh, the remit today mainly is to talk about the health detox aspect of Islam and inshallah we do Q and A's afterwards as well so let's start so the first time Ramadan is mentioned in the Quran is Surah Al-Baqarah second chapter of the Quran the longest chapter of the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Shahru Ramadan al-lazi unzila fihi al-Quran hudal linnas wa bayyinat min al-huda so Shahru Ramadan the month of Ramadan is the month in which we we reveal the Quran, a guidance for mankind, um, and um, a, guidance for, a guidance for mankind. And bayanat mean clear signs. Um, so this is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala speaking about the Ramadan itself. Okay, good. Yeah, cool. So the Quran is the guidance we as Muslims follow. It is a manual to live an optimal life. But what a lot of people fail to realize is in the Quran we have a lot of of tips and tricks and hints on how to live a healthy, medically optimal uh, a, a healthy, optimal life from a medical point of view as well. So Ramadan coming tonight, 30 or 29 days of fasting. We know that Ramadan is the month of fasting. However, this is a very big misconception. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, it is the month of the Quran. It is the month we reveal the Quran in. So the whole purpose of Ramadan is to be a vehicle. For all, The whole purpose of fasting is, is for it to be a vehicle for us to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I was speaking to one of the brothers earlier. Maybe 10 years ago, if you spoke about fasting as a vehicle for more clarity, you would have got laughed at. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our khaliq. He is our chief architect. He's the one that designed us. So he's telling us fasting has been given to you as a vehicle to understand the Quran because Ramadan is the month of the Quran. Ramadan is not the month of fasting. It is the month of the Quran because Laylatul Qadr, the night of power, is in Ramadan. So, so we know this. So, Ramadan, the month of the Quran, Allah has prescribed fasting for us to get closer to the book of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So, why is this relevant to health? This goes back to the whole concept of fasting. Fasting as a means for clarity. It, 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 Subhanallah, how beautiful is Islam? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed this one and a half millennium ago. Fasting as a means of tazkiyah, purification. When we talk about tazkiyah, we talk about it from a taskeetul nafs point of view, taskeetul qalb, purification, cleanliness of the heart. But what about cleanliness, purification of the body? Now, as a, as a doctor, I can tell you, we prescribe fasting to our patients. And the studies have been done that, that suggest that those that fast have much lower levels of arsenic, uh, toxic waste, so many like uric acid for instance which causes gout in a faster state alhamdulillah our levels of this go down so not only are we purifying our bodies and our souls and our wealth because oftentimes people give their zakat in ramadan as well and zakat from the word um, tazkiyah purification of wealth so so many things happen in ramadan to purify our nafs and to purify our soul our heart our intentions etc but what about purification of health so today I'm going to talk about some of the benefits of fasting. Now, the brother said, do you want to eat lunch? I said, I'm not, I don't normally eat lunch. I'll just have one meal a day. I've been doing this for eight years now. This is called intermittent fasting. You might have heard of the word OMAD, one meal a day. Sometimes nomad, I eat no meals a day. We've been programmed and conditioned in this society to wake up, have breakfast, and then have lunch, and then have dinner. Three meals a day. But in fact, this goes against our fitra. Our fitra is not to eat three meals a day. Our fitrah is to have one meal a day, maximum two meals a day. And some of the scholars said this was the way of the Anbiya. The Anbiya would eat one meal a day. The pious, the pious predecessors would eat two meals a day. And they said humans who are jahil or, and, and animals, they would eat three meals a day. But this is what we've been conditioned to do, three meals a day. As soon as you wake up, have cereal, have lunch, have dinner. But 
Now we're getting more and more evidence as to the benefits of having one meal a day. And Ramadan is a really good way to kickstart one meal a day as a lifestyle habit. So Ramadan, we're forced to eat one meal a day anyway, because you can't eat throughout daylight hours. So you're forced to eat just iftar. Um, most people don't have sahur. But if they do, they may have some water, some dates. So it's not really a meal, is it, sahur? So they have one meal that is. So Ramadan is a perfect way to kickstart a lifelong habit of one meal a day. Now, let me tell you some of the benefits. So I've been doing uh, one meal a day now, alhamdulillah, for since 2015. I remember September 2015, uh, on the way back from Kenya, uh, I said, you know what, I'm going to eat one meal a day. So it's been, almost been nine years now. The benefits that I've had from eating one meal a day is the fact that it gives me clarity, it's good skin, alhamdulillah. I can focus, I'm not, I don't get the post-lunch slump. Sometimes you get the sl- uh, slump after lunchtime, you have a sandwich or something, you feel a bit queasy afterwards. This is again to do with insulin, glucose, all that kind of stuff. So having one meal a day, in the evenings perhaps, or just between lunch and dinner time, Sets your whole day up nicely. You're not obsessed with food, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us in the Quran, "Have you not seen the person that takes his desires as his gods?" And we think shirk as being worship of idols, but shirk could also mean worship of food, of clothes, of career, worship of wealth. This is shirk, right? These are our today's idols. Today's idols are not the statues that they had at the time of Ibrahim al-Islam or at the time of Rasul in Mecca. Today's idols are on the billboards, the big conglomerates, the big companies, uh, consumerism. This is our main idol and Allah SWT warns us about this. You know, have you not seen the one that takes his own desires, his own shahwat as his own God? So this is something to be mindful of. Secondly, you're not only not thinking about food, but your whole day is structured and your whole day is more focused. Why? Fasting, you might have seen in Ramadan as well, for some reason your focus does, in- does improve and increase because you're not thinking about food. So medically speaking, your levels of adrenaline increase when you're fasting because your body is like, where's the food? So your body's sending out signals, not hunger signals, but sending out alert signals. Why is this man not eating? Is, is he in danger? So you're more alert. You're you're fit and firing. You're more focused. With food, you you after having food, you go into a state of rest and digest. So you might have seen after iftar, uh, before tarawi, you're a bit you know you're a bit sluggish. Whereas the rest of your salahs have a bit more energy. They have they have more energy because you've not eaten your body, your, your blood supply is not being diverted to the gut your blood supply is being diverted to where it should be the brain the brain is only 4% of the body's uh, total body weight but it consumes 25% of the body's glucose so if the brain is underfiring because the gut is overfiring you're going to have tiredness sluggishness, lethargy. So that's one of the big benefits of having one meal a day. Um, so Ramadan is a great way to start that, by the way. It's a really good way to get into the habit of what we call time-restricted eating, where you do not have three meals a day. Because think about it, if you have three meals a day, you've got a 12-hour eating window. You eat at 7, you eat at 1 p.m., or you eat, and then eat at 7 p.m. So you be eating for 12 hours. That's the eating window. Ramadan, your eating window is reduced to only 6-7 hours because for 18 hours, you're fasting. So what's even what's an even better way of doing that is in Ramadan, and hopefully your brothers can uh, take advice of this, is just for sahur, just have water. Just for water for sahur, that means you're having one meal a day anyway. You're having one meal, your iftar is just one meal a day. Because sahur will set you up in a, if you have the wrong kind of sahur, it will set you up in a very, it will set you up in the, on, on the back foot. Because you start the day sluggish. You've had this, a fried breakfast at three in the morning or four in the morning. The human body is not designed for that. And when the Prophet used to have sahur, you'd make it very small, uh, small, sallallahu alayhi you'd make it very small, manageable. So I always say sahur should be one handful and your iftar should be three handfuls. We're doing five handfuls for iftar and three handfuls for sahur. So we're obviously starting the day on the back foot. And we know having a full stomach makes you lazy. 
having a full stomach makes you lazy. And there was days where Rasul وسلم, would go without eating for many days, by the way. And now we know the benefit of this. Have you heard of three day fasts, 72 hour fasts, 48 hour fasts? This is now something which is commonly practiced in the medical community. So, guys who like to biohack, they practice three day fasts, five day fasts, seven day fasts, where they just have nothing but water. Nothing but water. And obviously, black coffee as well. So, what you what what are you allowed to have when you're fasting? Black tea, black coffee, green tea, herbal tea, and water. Why why these? Because these things do not spike your insulin. Insulin, you might have heard of insulin in diabetes. So insulin is a fat storage hormone. When you spike your insulin, particularly eating three meals a day, you're spiking insulin. You're going to keep storing fat. And when you store fat, you will slow down. We know this. You know, if you look at some of the... It's, 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 no, it's no coincidence that some of the philosophers, the Greek philosophers, the, the Roman Stoics, you know, uh, if, you, if you see the statues, etc., they were all chiseled and ripped. Because having more muscle makes you sharper. Why is that though? Why does holding less body fat and holding more muscle make you sharp? Does anyone know the answer? Which is the hormone that begins with T? Yeah, exactly. So if you look at Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, they've, Dr. Dre even, they've just ballooned up in the last few, few years with a lot of muscle. That's a side effect of taking TRT. And it's not for the muscle, it's a side effect of that. But having more muscle makes you sharper. Because... Testosterone is an executive functioning hormone. It makes you executive function. You know, it makes you execute. It gives you the ability to be decisive. So CEOs take testosterone not to build muscle. M- muscle builds along alongside that. But they take testosterone to make better decisions in the workplace. So, you know, this is from Rajula, it's from being a man. A man is the qawam of the Nisa. A man has almost 20 times the levels of testosterone a woman does. So he should be muscular, fit, stronger than the woman. But what we're seeing now in the last 30 years is hormones of all over the place. Women's estrogen is decreasing, fertility rates are decreasing, men's test levels are declining, estrogen, men is increasing, subhanAllah. So we're seeing like a biochemical apocalypse in a way. But one of the best ways to increase t- testosterone without steroids or without TRT, because that's another topic, by the way. Is it haram? Is it makru? That's, that's another topic. But one of the best ways to increase testosterone it's through fasting, believe it or not. Medically proven. Why? Because you're in a stress response. Your body thinks, you know, you, you know, it's a stress response. So what happens is a growth hormone gets released. Growth hormone will help you build muscle. So a quick lecture just on the benefits of fasting. That's a medical benefit, by the way. What about the benefits for longevity? We know people that fast live longer. We know this. People that, that fast live longer. Generally, they live longer. Obviously, we know as Muslims, our life span is, is pre-written. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Quran, do not kill yourselves. And what are we doing with our food? Food should be halal and tayyib. Today's food is neither. It's, it's none of that. It's not. Well, it, it, it could be halal. As in, it is dhuba, it is zabi. But is it tayyib? Tayyib, is mean, tayyib meaning good for you. Tayyiban. Also, Tayyib and Tahara go together. Tayyib means pure or wholesome. Probably a better word, word is wholesome. And uh, Tahara means purity. Today's food is heavily processed. It's impure in many, many ways because it's got chemi- em- emulsifiers, E numbers, chemicals, col- you know, colorings, additive preservatives. So today's food is actually not pure. It's not pure. And this is affecting our lifespan. It's like smoking. Smoking has got carcinogens. But you know, there was an article uh, literally about 10 days ago in The Guardian saying that the food we have, the crisp packets, the chocolates, the protein bars, and a lot of the stuff we have causes 33 diseases, subhanAllah. 33 diseases are directly linked to ultra-processed foods. And they're made in such a way to make you, to make you addicted. They're made, they've got a perfect combination of sugar and salt to make you addicted. But food at the time of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all the Anbiya before him and the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Taba Tabi'een was functional. Food will be functional. So you could you know, keep your back straight. You could go for expeditions. You could, you could go for travel. You could go for wars. Now food has gone beyond functional into comfort. And we know comfort kills a man. So now is the best time to start fasting. Ramadan is gonna gonna give us the catalyst inshallah to incorporate fasting into our lifestyle. 
fasting should be a lifestyle. It's not just Ramadan, by the way. And Allah's given us a blueprint. Fast for focus. Think about it. Fasting, Allah's prescribed us. Allah wants us to get closer to the Quran in, in Ramadan. So He prescribed for us fasting. He could have prescribed fasting in, in Shaban or in you know Shawwal or any, any of the other months. But He prescribed fasting in the month of Ramadan. Think about that for a second. It's, you know, if you think about it, if you deep it on a, on a very deep level, Allah, obviously Allah created science. Like, you know, science, we're only catching up with what Allah knows anyway. So the fact that He prescribed fasting for focus and taqwa. Allah says taqwa, right? But have you heard of the concept of food taqwa? Food taqwa, we, we, know, we know taqwa. Like, when you don't look at something which, you, you know, is not good for you, don't listen to something. But what about food taqwa? Next time you pick up something, do you have taqwa? about what, what's in that bar, what's in that packet, what's in that bottle. Tak, food taqwa, by the way. Taqwa should be all-encompassing, because we're aiming to be muhsin. We're not aiming to be just Muslims. We're not aiming uh, to be uh, in a muttaqi. We're aiming for excellence. And I talk about this a lot in my podcast. As Muslim men, we should be hitting eights and nines across the board. In our physique, in our mindset, in the way we speak, in the way we communicate, ihsan, ihsan means excellence. We should be hitting the top numbers across the board. And it starts with the diet, by the way. Because Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us this. The son of Adam does not fill a vessel worse than his stomach. And so many diseases come from the stomach, by the way. We've heard of the gut microbiome. It's a very, very recent medical discovery. But Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about this. One and a half millennium ago. That the food you eat affects your mood. Have you heard of Talbina? Talbina was Bali. You know, he would, he would have it in, in winter time to stave off from low mood. And now we're learning about the good microbiome. But the Islam's already told us this one and a half millennium ago. So my advice to you brothers this Ramadan is, Alhamdulillah, use Ramadan to get closer to the Quran, Tazkiyatul Nafs, purification of the soul, but also use Ramadan to purify your bodies as well. Because honestly, I, c- I can tell you, Nine out of ten of us, our bodies are floating in chemicals. Wallahi, they're floating in chemicals. Pesticides and these artificial hormones, they're floating in chemicals and preservatives and e-numbers and, and, and emulsifiers and additives and sweeteners. Our bodies, wallahi, our blood's flowing. The question is then, can you really have a pure heart if your blood is filthy? That's my question to you, brother. So use Ramadan to really purify your blood through your diet. Minimize fried food. Have high protein, low carb diets. I would always suggest not not zero carbs. We are Ummat al the, the the middle nation. We don't believe in extreme diets. Keto is extreme, carnivore is extreme. That's extreme diets, by the way. We don't believe in veganism as well. That's extreme diet because it's just you know no dairy produce. We we are the Ummat al We are the best and middle nation. So we believe in 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 the middle path, right? So. This Ramadan really kicks out your healthy uh, habits for life, inshallah, through minimizing processed and fried food, having more water. Like, you know, p- people, honestly, they ha- the only water they have in Ramadan is Rubicon mango. That's the only liquid they have. Uh, by the way, I-, I know this for a fact. You should do iftar with half a liter, which is one bottle. Uh, sorry, this is yeah, 500 mils. Half a liter, one bottle or two bottles, which is one liter. At least at iftar. And then from iftar to taravi, have another half. And then at taravi, have another half. And then maybe have another half uh, at sahur. Two and a half liters minimum. Minimum in Ramadan. When you do that, you have two and a half liters minimum of water a day. Imagine how much less food you're going to have. Because we know of the third, the rule of thirds, right? In Ramadan, we, we, do, f- we, we do five thirds food. Literally five thirds. And that's where you get the, that's where you get the burps. Literally, food's, all, food's coming out. You know, there's no room for gas or water. So, have more water, less food. And when you're going to have the food, make sure it's not processed. Make sure it's tayyib. Make sure it's, you know, um, there's purity in it. Obviously, we, we talk about halal. But honestly, we, we don't talk enough about food being, food being tayyib. So, that's the spirituality of Ramadan. And you'll see, y- y- your prayer, your khushu will improve. Because your blood is no longer... F- you know, floating in chemicals. These chemicals are designed to make you addicted. You know, even crisp packets. Have you heard of the Pringles? Once you pop, you can't stop. That's what, that's one of their mottos, right? Because they're designed to be addictive. They're designed to get you hooked. Why? Because when you're hooked, 
you buy more. Consumerist society. As Muslims, we are not allowed to engage in narcotics and gambling because we know the person is being exploited. This poor person is going to get addicted to gambling or to alcohol, so we can't do it. We can't consume it, we can't sell it. But it's the same framework that's used by the conglomerates in the West to get you addicted to processed foods. It's the same marketing psychology. Clever marketing, cereal ads. This is what cereal is a big con, by the way. Cereals, you know, there's no need to eat at 9 in the morning, 7 in the morning. There's no need. You, you don't deserve it. You just left for t- t- you know, 10 hours or 8 hours. Why do you deserve to eat breakfast? Breakfast should be break fast. When you break it fast, we, we just wake up and eat, start eating. So this whole industry about uh, came about in, in the 50s. Cereal uh, breakfast being the most important meal, meal of the day. That's a huge, huge marketing con, by the way. And these companies employ marketing psychologists to get you hooked on their food. So my advice to you, brothers in Ramadan, definitely up your water intake. Definitely decrease your food intake. Actually, you, you don't need to decrease your food intake. It will automatically, automatically decrease by increasing water. So see what happens when you drink more water, you'll eat less food, inshallah. And when you are going to eat food, make sure it's not processed. Make sure it's more vegetables in there. Make sure it's less white carbohydrates. We have a very beige diet. Nans, white rice, pasta, very white. Trying to go away from white, more into the pulses, the legumes, the beans, the lentils. So if you're going to have the carbohydrates, make them slow carbs. So a very good um, a book is called The 4-Hour uh, Body. The 4-Hour Body talks about it by Tim Ferriss. And he's a big proponent of slow carb diets. Because this one is the most researched, by the way. Most researched diet is uh, the slow carb diet. Our diets now are very convenient. You know, the whole industry of fast food, processed foods is very convenient. It's fast food, but why is it fast food? Because it spikes your insulin very quickly. It also spikes your dopamine very quickly as well. And you want dopamine insulin to be regulated. Otherwise, you become a slave to your desires. So, I'm going to end it on that, inshallah. That's just some tips for Ramadan. I'm going to open up, inshallah, for some questions and answers uh, about anything about business or food, drink, um, Ramadan generally.